It's my privilege as the co-secretary for Hatfield Heads Up to welcome all of you to tonight's community forum, Beyond Gun Laws. Heads Up, Hatfield embraces acceptance and dismantles stigma. From our early beginnings, when a handful of us met to address a growing mental health needs in our community, we have grown to become an all-volunteer organization dedicated to promoting and supporting mental health in our community. We've done this by offering mental health first aid, by hosting documentaries such as Resilience and Angst with local experts to address community questions, and by running Waterpalooza, a fun family-oriented oriented fundraiser designed to raise awareness about mental health. Please watch for this year's Waterpalooza coming up in July. Visit our table or meet any of the Heads Up volunteers here tonight. They're wearing purple shirts, many of them, many of us, uh, to learn more about Heads Up and to join us as we continue to support mental health efforts throughout our community. Some of the recent statistics indicate that while 37% of gun-related deaths in our country are due to homicide, 60% are due to suicide. The VA reports that 17 U.S. veterans die by gun-related suicide every day. And child firearm suicide has risen by 82% in the last 10 years. Because of these growing public health concerns, Hatfield Heads Up felt the need to organize tonight's community forum. On behalf of Heads Up, I wish to thank the following for their efforts. The Hatfield Heads Up Planning Committee. You know who you are. <laughs> the Northwestern District Attorney's Office, our co-sponsor for tonight's event. Thank you. Hatfield Public Schools for allowing us to use their facility. Hatfield Community TV for broadcasting this event. And of course, our distinguished panel of speakers. Finally, most importantly, we thank all of you for joining us for tonight's community discussion. At this time, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our moderator, the Chief Law Enforcement Officer for Hampshire and Franklin Counties and the Town of Athol, District Attorney David E. Sullivan. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Um, I'm just very impressed by the uh, group of folks that we have here today, our distinguished panel and our guest speaker. Um, I'd like to start with uh, an introduction of our guest speaker tonight. Um, Ian uh, Thalheimer is a Holyoke-based artist, an educator, and a survivor of the 1992 school shooting at Simons Rock College in Great Barrington. A 2017 Every Town Survivor Fellow, Thalheimer is one of 40 people from across the United States to be part of a flagship leadership program for survivors of gun violence. In recognition that survivor voices are critical to raising awareness, Every Town Fellows work on education and legislative advocacy. I'd like to welcome Ann Thalheimer. Good evening, everyone. So I have some prepared uh, remarks. Uh, I have a piece that I want to read, but I also have some information in the middle. It's because often in these kind of conversations, I tell my story, and then we get to the heart of it, which is the, OK, so what do we do? What is the action that we take? Uh, so that's going to be kind of the, the middle piece of what I'm doing. Um, so my name's Anne, and I live in Holyoke. I grew up in rural Massachusetts in a small town that never really felt like home. I went to a small regional high school where I didn't fit in, I didn't thrive, it didn't fit, it didn't work, it wasn't me. So in my second year of high school, my guidance counselor suggested Simon's Rock, which is a unique early college program in Great Barrington. 
300 students on a rural campus, a college for teenagers, ready to start college work before finishing high school. My parents had separated the year before, and my dad drove me to the interview, that rite of passage of going to the college interview with your dad. Uh, and I got the acceptance letter a week later. I was 16. And when I started in the fall of 1991, I went from being weird and different to finally starting to fit in somewhere. I made friends. I fell in love. And I found other people who found the world as compelling as I did. I found a community of learners. I found a place where I finally belonged. And I made friends who I thought I would have throughout my life and a mentor who I thought would shape me throughout my profession. These are all things that I never thought possible, things I never thought I could have. My friend Galen was a semester ahead of me and six days older. He was the good-natured, goofy weirdo on campus who everybody knew. Uh, it was a tiny campus where everyone knew everyone else, 300 people in the woods, small and close-knit, where everyone was involved in everybody else's lives. In my second year, I signed up for two classes with this tiny spitfire of a professor from Argentina. He was fluent in four languages and more worldly and well-read than I could ever hope to be. He was the first person ever in my life who told me that I was smart when it sounded like praise. He pushed me to work harder, learn more, and to really live and challenge and explore. And I was writing a paper for his class that December during finals week. It was late at night and the air was crisp and cold. It had snowed earlier that day and campus was dark. And then the phone rang, a voice telling us to turn out the lights, lock the doors, and get down on the floor, someone shooting on campus. We thought it was a hunter who had stumbled onto campus by mistake. We later found out that the murderer was one of us, a fellow student who had legally purchased his gun through a loophole in Massachusetts law, which honored the laws of the purchaser's home state. He was from Montana. He'd had bullets shipped to campus and only surrendered because the gun kept jamming. He had enough ammunition to kill us all. My friend and my mentor were both killed. Nyakunyan died as he drove his car back onto campus, possibly to get a book from his office or something he'd forgotten. Galen died in the library, having run outside to see what had happened. Four others were wounded and the rest of us were left wondering in the woods how this could have happened. How could one of us have done this? How could these brilliant, gentle people who had been so very present in the world were just so suddenly gone? And then 20 years later to the day, my friends messaged me over and over to not turn on the news, to not read the headlines about an elementary school in Connecticut not very far from where I live in Massachusetts, where yet another school endured yet another tragedy, Sandy Hook. This should not be normal. This should not be everyday news. Teaching should not be a life-threatening profession. Preschoolers to postdocs now know regularly what to do in an active shooter situation. Every day, people's senses of safety and security in their homes, churches, and schools erodes. We must work to change this, and this is a responsibility that we all share. So, how do we do it? The reality is that my experience is pretty unusual, not only because it was so long ago, but because mass shootings like the one I survived, like Sandy Hook, like Parkland, are statistical anomalies. Mass shootings are rare when we look at the whole picture of everyday gun violence. When I use the word survivor, it is intentionally broad. If your life has been impacted by gun violence, you are considered a survivor. But it is also, it must be a word that people choose for themselves. Additionally, we have to center survivor voices at the heart of this work, and we have to be broad in our perspective. I talk with a lot of people who don't always get it, who think of my trauma as lesser because I wasn't wounded. But trauma isn't a contest. There are lots of things that we need to think about in discussing this. One of the things that I think about a lot is the concept of no notoriety. I don't use the name of uh, my campus murderer. I don't speak it. 
He survived. He is incarcerated in Massachusetts for life. He is nationally known. Interviews with him pop up from time to time. I don't want to center him at the heart of my survivor experience. I want to remember Galen and Nyakonyan and my 18-year-old self and my friends and my campus and my community. And I want to use those things to put good into the world instead of focusing on murderers, instead of focusing on trauma, instead of focusing on the terror. Why aren't we spending more time with survivors and learning from their perspectives instead? I think about toxic gun culture, and I say this in a broad perspective. I grew up in a gun-owning family. My dad loved target shooting and skeet shooting. We went to the range with him when I was a kid. I have two younger brothers. One of them is very much a gun enthusiast. I have a niece and a nephew who are growing up in a home with safely stored guns and ammunition. My brother is teaching his children the same way my father taught us, that guns are not toys, and guns are not to be played with. Um, one of the things that I think we need to work on more is how to talk with one another about these things. When our kids go over to someone else's house, we have a list of things that we ask about. Do you have dogs? Is there a swimming pool? What are rules around video games and television? But do we ask about gun storage? And if we don't, why not? Are we nervous about having those conversations? Do we not know how to get those things started? But the reality is that more than two million American children live in homes with guns that are not stored safely and securely. We see this on the news all the time about these tragic accidents. They're preventable. We can prevent them. 4.6 million American children live in homes with guns that are both loaded and unlocked. In incidences of gunfire on school grounds, 78% of those shooters under the age of 18 obtained the gun or guns from their homes or the homes of their friends. 41% of adolescents in gun-owning households report having easy access to the guns in their homes. And these are things that we need to think about and consider one of, the one of the pieces of the organization that I work with has a program called Be Smart. And it's a public education campaign asking gun owners and non-gun owners alike to take simple steps to reduce the number of unintentional shootings, suicides, and homicides that occur when children or teens get a hold of guns that are not stored responsibly. And it's a pretty basic framework that's designed to help parents and adults normalize these conversations about gun safety and to take these responsible actions that can prevent child gun deaths and injuries. It's pretty straightforward. When you talk about be smart, the smart part stands for secure all guns in your home and vehicles. And I was really excited to see that there are gun locks over here. I think that's fantastic. I think that's crucial. The M is for modeling responsible behavior around guns. That's on us, we're the adults. Asking about the presence of unsecured guns in other homes, recognizing the risks of teen suicide, and telling your peers to be smart. So we have material available on these. Um, Doris, we have folks in the red shirt. If you're interested in learning more about that, pick up a pamphlet from Doris. And I wanted to end with a piece that I wrote a couple of years ago um, in commemoration of Parkland, because that, that year marker is coming up this Friday. Um, and it's a letter I wrote called Dear Survivor. Dear Survivor, we haven't met. My name's Anne, and I live in Western Massachusetts. I'm an artist and educator. I'm into local politics and community organizing. I make cute hats and I teach kids. And I've been an autobio cartoonist since I was 16. I have tattoos and cats and I'm a roller derby official. And I love Iceland. I look younger than I am, but I don't get carded at bars anymore. I dye my hair, I work at a museum. Most of the time I look like I've got it pretty together. I finished my bachelor's degree at a little liberal arts college at the end of 1994 went to work for an experiential education company for a semester and then started grad school at the University of Delaware in August 95. I put myself through grad school as a teaching assistant and I was 27 when I finished my PhD in 2002. 
On the surface, we might not have so much in common, but I am also a survivor of gun violence. In December 1992, a classmate of mine was able to illegally and easily buy a cheap Chinese-made SKS through a then loophole in Massachusetts law that honored the laws of the purchaser's home state. He loaded the gun with bullets he'd had shipped to campus and walked through the cold December air, firing at anything that moved. We found out later that he had enough ammunition to kill us all, but the gun kept jamming. Frustrated, he called the police and surrendered. I drive past the courthouse where his trial was held almost every day. It's a major landmark in the city where I work. I once had a contested traffic ticket there. I knew I'd been in that building before, but I don't remember being there. I'm told that I was at a protest at the State House in April 1993, where we called for action, but I remember none of this. I have profound memory loss. Part of that is time, but more of that is trauma. It took me years before I talked about it with people who weren't at Simon's Rock with me. It was six months before I could fall asleep without sobbing. My mother says that I woke up screaming in the weeks after it happened. I don't remember. Our school shooter is still alive. Newsweek interviewed him after Virginia Tech. He gets national news coverage and people on the internet who defend him, who latch onto his easy fabricated excuse about hearing voices and they give him sympathy. And that makes me angry. I went to school with a murderer. I, hit, I sit with that heavy truth sometimes. I worry about losing my dead as time passes. I wear them on my skin as if to keep myself from forgetting. Two tattoos of origami paper cranes on my shoulder blades for my friend Galen, who wordlessly pressed folded paper cranes into my palm one day as we walked across campus. And a Franz Kafka illustration from the trial on my leg, the first tattoo I got all those years ago in grad school from my brilliant, charming professor Nyakunyan, whose love of learning and sense of style I've never seen matched. After I returned from an intensive leadership training in Washington, DC, learning how to amplify my own voice as a survivor, I had an image intended to represent infinite space, along with the epitaph from Nakunyan's grave marker in Argentina added to my shoulder. They are always with me. They will never leave me. I wear them on my skin the way this tragedy is woven into the very fabric of the adult I have become. I have lived with this for more than 25 years, and it's only in the last five that I've really been able to think of myself as a survivor, and only within the last year that I've been able to center my activism around it. For years, I thought about writing it down, creating a book or a document, something to tell my story, and for years, I could not. What changed me was Sandy Hook. That overlapping tragedy feels overwhelming, an avalanche of unyielding horror, and it spurred me to action. And I still feel like it is not enough, because as we know too well, gun violence in our country has reached epidemic proportions. Each mass shooting, every time, feels like all of the air leaving your lungs, like the ground giving way, like everything is wrong. So from one survivor to another, I offer these thoughts. You will meet people who tell you how you should grieve. Do not listen to them. You know the contours of your own heart better than anyone else in the world. They will ask you if you're over it yet. We both know you will never be over it. People will not know what to say to you. They'll offer you statements that are well-intentioned but feel empty. This will hurt. People will talk about forgiveness. Everyone has their own journey, but I now know that I am not less of a person for recognizing that the perpetrator has no forgiveness with me. You'll hear a lot about therapy. If it's useful, do it. If you don't think it's useful, know how to get it anyway. PTSD is nasty and not well understood, and we're terrible at dealing with grief and tragedy in the United States. I wish I had done more of it. Find purpose. I have found purpose in my work as an Everytown Survivor Fellow, where I tell my own story to legislators and lawmakers and people at meetings. I make people cry, and I feel badly about this, but I know that they will remember who I lost, and that is powerful. You will feel badly that you wound people when you tell them your story. There is power in this. Do not believe the myth of the good survivor. There are as many ways to be a survivor as gun violence as there are gun violence survivors. Some days getting out of bed will be your most major achievement. Some days you will not be able to get out of bed. Self-care is good care. Remember to eat. Try to sleep if you can. It's okay if you can't. Honor your dead. Keep living. Know that I see you. Love, Anne. Thank you.
What I'd like to do now is introduce uh, our distinguished panel, and uh, I want to start with, um, with Heather White, who is um, a member of the Massachusetts chapter of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And seated uh, to her left and your right is the Smith College <coughs> uh, School of Social Work professor, Josh Miller. And then we have a very distinguished student from Smith Academy, Ava Carter Mayo. Is that the right pronunciation for Mayo? Mayo, okay. Ava Mayo, Ava Carter Mayo. And then our Hatfield Police Chief, Michael uh, Dekocek. And uh, to his left is our state representative, Lindsay Sabadosa, and she represents the 1st Hampshire District, which is Hatfield, Northampton, Southampton, West Hampton and Montgomery. And uh, to her left is our state senator, uh, Joe Comerford, and she represents the Hampshire Franklin District with a number of towns that I'm not gonna go through, but one of them, one of them includes Hatfield. So, uh, so I'm gonna uh, start with uh, Heather. And uh, you know, we're gonna have people uh, talk. Uh, I don't know how long you guys wanted to talk for. About five minutes. About five minutes, okay, that's great. Good evening. Um, as he mentioned, I'm Heather White with the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And while we are the largest um, nonprofit for suicide prevention in the country, we are actually very much grassroots and local. Um, we have our Massachusetts and Western Mass chapter and volunteers and boards. And I got involved in this work about eight years ago when I almost lost my own life to postpartum depression and suicide. And I want to thank everyone involved in this today for bringing us here, for bringing suicide prevention to this conversation, because even though all two-thirds of all firearms deaths in this country are suicides, so often suicide prevention is never brought into the conversation. It's, it's never a topic. We don't talk about it. It should be at the forefront of this discussion, um, and so often it isn't. So thank you so much for including us and, and for bringing this topic. And it also comes into play when we talk about our children and our young people today. Um, most people don't realize that suicide is the second leading cause of death in our young people ages 10 to 14 in our country, behind only accidents, making suicide, depression, um, mental health conditions the number one medical cause of death in our children ages 10 to 14. And that number expands out to 35-year-olds. And our goal at AFSP is to create suicide safer communities. And just as we know that our everyday suicide prevention efforts has to move beyond the hospital and clinical world, and it has to get out into our communities, into peer-to-peer -peer support, into educating everyone, we know the same is true in the firearms community as well. And that's why I was so pleased to see the topic tonight of moving beyond gun control and how can we bring the message of safety and prevention directly to the firearms owning community. Um, we at AFSP have partnered with the National Shooting Sports Foundation to create our Talk Saves Lives Firearms program where we're bringing our message of safety and prevention directly to the firearms owning community. And we have been warmly received and embraced by this community, which I'm not gonna lie, we weren't sure at first how this was gonna go. Um, but we're going directly to the firearms retailers, directly to the sportsmen's clubs and the gun ranges and bringing this message of safety and prevention when there's a mental health crisis in the gun owners, in the firearm owners' life, in their families. Thank you for mentioning um, the percentage of violence that happens because of an unsecured firearm in the home. Um, those are the kinds of things that we're trying to educate the firearms owning community on. Um, we have a bold goal at AFSP to reduce the rate of suicide by 20% in the next five years. And surely on the basis of the numbers of people we are losing <coughs> to suicide by firearm, that's gonna play a major role in bringing those numbers down and saving thousands of lives every single year. And we're also aware that access to firearms, access to any lethal means increases someone's risk. So we're taking our educational programs and we're taking these trainings to uh, expand them to corrections facilities, to our first responders, to our military and our veterans. Because anytime you can put time and information in between someone and their access to the most lethal means, which is a firearm, 
we know that we can save lives um, and prevent the loss of life through a firearm, which is most often um, a firearm. Again, two-thirds of all firearms deaths are suicides, and 50% of all suicides are with a firearm as well. So if we can begin to address the access to firearms, get the message of prevention and education out directly to the firearms owning community, we can start bringing those numbers down. So thank you so much um, for including suicide prevention in tonight's discussions. We feel it is a key component and where we can have a greatest impact. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I'm Josh Miller and um, it's great to see all of you here and I appreciate your interest in this topic. I am going to talk briefly about the impact of school violence, school shootings on children and families, and then talk a little bit about what we can do to help people, particularly students, and also just kind of look at the pros and cons of doing drills, particularly active shooter drills in schools. So one of the things I want to start with is that when we have these terrible mass shootings in schools like Parkland or Sandy Hook, obviously they affect the people who are there, but they actually affect everybody. Okay, so that every child who knows about it can vicariously be afraid because of what happened. Um, every parent starts to be afraid about sending their children to school. And every teacher who's working in a school knows that this could potentially happen in a school where they're working. So the impact of these uh, incidents is far bigger than the people who are directly affected. Um, I also want to just mention that, the, that attacks like this take a terrible toll on first responders. I am a member of a team that supports police, fire, EMTs after something hard has happened. And anytime anything happens to a child, no matter how seasoned you are, how professional you are, it's the type of thing that gets through to you. And particularly when children are attacked in schools, there are really long-lasting residues for the people who respond as well as the people who were attacked. Um, so one of the things about school violence and, and, and gun violence in schools is like I respond a lot to hurricanes and earthquakes and those types of quote natural disasters. You know, they're often called acts of God. It's not like, you know, you could necessarily predict what was going to happen. Um, with a school shooting, it's intentional. Somebody's trying to hurt somebody, as in the uh, story that we just heard. And the other thing is that it's directed at children, which seems like the last group that anybody should be violent towards. So what does that do? It really shakes our sense of safety, of trust, social trust, trusting other people, and it can really create a terrible sense of pessimism. Um, and people can lose faith in humankind. So one of the things that I wanted to mention is that what happens after an attack can either help students and, and teachers and parents to calm down or it can get them more revved up, okay? Because having armed guards and metal detectors in schools can be reassuring to some students, but it can also be terribly frightening and um, evocative of what just happened when police came into a school, for example, uh, for other children. So I want to look at just what are some of the things that happen to kids after such attacks. And one of the things that people talk about a lot is PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. The studies vary so considerably, you know, that, that some studies show 10% of kids who have experienced this will experience um, PTSD, while others go as high as 80%. So I don't really think that that helps us that much. But there are certain things like the age of the child, their prior experiences, their sources of strength and resilience, their social networks, their, their support or lack of support, all of these things mitigate and affect how a child will react after something like a school shooting. But one healing factor that's really important for all children is knowing that people care about you, that they want you to succeed, 
and that they will be there for you despite what happened. So children will often try to, re to avoid what they have just experienced. So they might be afraid to go to school, they might have difficulty managing their emotions, they might cry suddenly, they might get really angry, um, they might be in a constant state of hyper alertness. They can't let go, they can't go to sleep because it's too dangerous. Something terrible has happened and so the body is saying, stay awake, stay on guard, be vigilant. Um, and all of this is damaging the kids both neurologically, hormonally, emotionally, and, um, and socially. So what helps kids when this type of thing happens? Predictable routines, kids love routines, they need to know what's coming and, and what to expect. Secondly, a sense of safety and reassurance and hope. We have to help children to regain a sense of safety. Third thing, an ability to calm themselves down. And there are lots of programs that are taught to elementary school kids about how to use mindfulness to actually learn how to calm yourself down when you're agitated. And the last thing is attachments and s with others and social support. It's really with teachers, with family, with other students, with older students. So last thing I just want to finish off with is drills. And in my opinion, I have, I have mixed feelings about them. On the one hand, I understand the good intentions and the fact that it helps prepare for something before <coughs> it happens. But it's also true that two bad things can happen. One is that kids become so used to a drill that they don't, realize, they don't react when something actually happens because it's become so normalized. And the second thing is that it can vicariously trigger, frighten, and undermine a child's sense of security because kids often don't know the difference between a drill and an, an actual event. So those are some of the risks of this. And I guess what I would argue in conclusion is that I think that school administrators, teachers, staff have to have drills. It's really important for adults to know how to respond. But once something actually happens in a school, kids are going to be looking to adults to actually take leadership and tell them what to do. And so I'd be very cautious about exposing kids to really vicarious, um, potentially violent kinds of situations as much as possible and really get the adults prepared so that they can take care of kids when this type of thing happens. And I'll finish that. Thank you. Our next speaker is going to be Ava, and um, somebody actually had a question ahead of time for you. Um, and I know you've kind of grown up with all these school drills, and um, the question was, what's it like to be in school in, in the kind of the new environment, at least for us adults, mm -hmm. that uh, has these kind of uh, school protection drills? Um, yeah. Well, I've grown up in this school. I've been here since kindergarten, and it's my first year at the middle school. but. I think the protocol has always been the same and like how, what we do during them, but like your thinking behind it changes as you grow up. So I remember being early, like kindergarten, my first year, what we think of it and what they tell you is very different from what now. And I think I didn't really realize till this year, like what could actually happen and what could be the reality behind it. And I think it's the same for like a lot of my classmates, like what could actually happen and why we do these. What else would you like to share? Anything else? Um, the protocol, like what we do, has changed a little. Like we always, it always used to just be like whoever was in the office would come over the announcement and say the school will now be conducting a lockdown drill and we all always knew what to do. But in the last couple of years, we've been practicing what they call organic lockdowns, which is something they want to prepare us for if we see something in the hall or outside and we don't have time to call the office. And the teachers just yell into the hallway and they pass the message down the school so everybody knows and then you just follow the same protocol. But it's really, they want us to be prepared to, in case we don't have time and like it's the office can't do anything about it. Yeah. Um, yeah, 
actually a question about other chapter. Are any students upset about these drills? Does anybody ever talk about them? Um, I think when they happen, they do, they do say drill, so we all know it's not real, but I think if they didn't say drill, we would all be a little more freaked out. But personally, for my grade, nobody really, like, I've never seen anybody really get upset about it that much, but I think it does help when they tell us that it's a drill and the teachers know beforehand and they sometimes let us know. And I think if we saw the teachers being more panicky and, like, not saying drill, we didn't know what was going to happen, I think we would all be a lot more scared. Mm -hmm. um, probably don't need the microphone. <laughs> oh, you need it? Right. Okay. If I talk too loud, I'm sorry. I just want to touch base real quickly on, uh, and actually uh, the points that have been made so far. Um, with the importance when it comes to suicide and as we talk about guns with suicide and the reason guns and suicide are so important is because with guns you don't get a second chance um, it's it's lethal the first time around uh, where in suicides um, there, you know if you if you take that step uh, the chances of you dying from it and not getting a second chance uh, to to live uh, is, is definitely there, which is why it's so important to talk about guns with suicide. Um, also, the, with the traumatizing of uh, children, um, again, the, you know, there's, there's not a lot of research out there when we look at our, our younger children, um, our kindergartners, our first graders, our second graders. Um, some research will tell you, you know, they, they don't have any concept of time. So do they even know it's a drill that's going on, um, you know, when we talk to those younger kids? So, you know, these are areas that we need to look at when it comes to better understanding what works and what doesn't work. Um, and, and then regarding the organic lockdown drills and the regular lockdown drills, I'm not a fan of live drills. So that's not something we're going to be doing here in Hatfield, um, at least not any time in the, in the future. Live drills where they're using smoke grenades and pulling fire alarms and doing all this stuff. Again, unnecessary trauma. So, um, you know, taking a pulse of the, of the school and, and Ava here, um, it sounds like there isn't too much of a, of a uh, problem with the way we're doing things right now. Um, any way that that can be improved is great. Now, gun laws, we have a lot in this state already. Well, in fact, I think we're ranked seventh in the nation for the toughest gun laws, uh, which is really good. Um, our, when we look at uh, homicides in this state, they're, they're relatively low per capita. Um, do we need more laws? I don't think so. We need to enforce the laws that we have when it comes to illegal possession of firearms, uh, when it comes to safe storage of firearms. Um, safe storage is a, is a big one. If you're a, if you're a gun owner in this state, you should be storing your firearms properly, keeping them away from children, keeping them away from people who should not have them. Um, I, that's kind of a no-brainer for anybody that owns a gun, and most people respect that and understand that. Um, I don't know how many gun owners or licenses we have in the room. Don't don't show your hands, but. It wasn't particularly difficult to get a gun license or to buy a gun for any of you because if you're not disqualified by statute we issue you a gun permit and you get a gun so though we have some of the toughest laws in the nation it's not a hard thing to be a gun owner in this state but being a responsible gun owner is what's important and thankfully in Hatfield I can as the only community I can speak for we have a tremendous amount of responsible gun owners, which is terrific. This is a hard panel to follow. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm, I'm just going to um, also, again, thank uh, Heads Up for hosting this evening and the DA. Hatfield Public Schools and Anne for her keynote. Anne has been a longtime friend and I have heard her speak before, but 
it is moving and powerful every time. So thank you very much. And it's funny that the friends we pick in our lives, sometimes there, there are little things that overlap. So when I was listening to her story, it reminded me I grew up in a household where my father also had guns. Um, where he would take me target shooting with him. I'm not very good at it, and I uh, was really scared because when you are a little kid and you're trying to shoot a rifle, it kicks, and it hurts. And as an adult, I don't shoot guns because I had that experience when I was little. So I do know how to fill bullets. Um, and the other thing that we have in common is that I also attended Simon's Rock, but several years after Anne. So to hear her story and to envision that campus and to, to think of the things that happen there are really powerful. And you bring that with you as you make laws and you try to decide what's best for, for the people in your community. Um, I know that the sheriff, uh, the, I'm sorry, that the police chief just said we don't need any new gun laws. I'm so sorry, what? You're not the sheriff, you're the chief. I know, you're the chief, right? Okay, the police chief. Oh, did you want an upgrade tonight? Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, just that we, the there we go. Um, but I am, I was asked to, to mention some of the um, laws that are pending at the State House, so I am going to do that for you. And there were three that I'll mention, and they were all favorably reported out of committee, which means they've, they've had a hearing and they're still under consideration. Um, and so the three that I'm going to mention are um, it's one bill that was actually filed by a former law enforcement, Representative Linsky, and it would, um, if you're going to have a concealed weapon, it would require live fire training as well as part of your permitting process, and that's just for concealed. Um, there's also a bill that would um, regulate ghost, uh, ghost guns, so do-it-yourself kits or guns that you print with a 3D printer. And the final bill is legislation that would expand the contents of the reports published about um, gun crimes and preventing gun trafficking. So EOPS, the Executive Office of Public Safety and Security, publishes that. And it would just expand those reporting requirements so that we have a little more information. I'm really glad that we're talking a lot about suicide prevention tonight as well. Um, so I'm a mother of a 13-year-old. I talk about this a lot. And there was recently a suicide in the school system that she attends. And she knew more about that suicide, who it was, how it happened, exactly why, all the gossip about it, before I even knew that it had happened. That is a powerful reminder that our kids know a lot more than we think they do. And we have to prepare them better for that. So I don't have the answers this evening, but as I'm listening to the conversations about what do we do, I do know that communities like Hatfield have really good resources. You have, you have heads up here, and you have a community that does really try to respond. I know that there are similar groups in other communities, but they're unfortunately not all the way across the state. And I do think that our kids need resources that are targeted to them. You know, so there are a lot of national suicide prevention hotlines. Um, I've had the opportunity to call one once, and it's, it's, not, it's not always focused on the right age group. And so I think as a state, one of the things that I'm going to be looking at moving forward is how do we make sure that we have the resources that are available for our kids in middle school and in high school, because the number of suicides is just too high, whether it be by, by gun or by anything else, quite honestly. And that means really focusing on mental health, on, on substance abuse, and, um, and on providing counselors in our schools as well, who are really that front line of defense for our kids. And far too often, those positions are not funded in the ways that they need to be, and our schools just can't make those investments. So I'm going to continue to chew over everything that we said here this evening, and I look forward to, to questions and comments from all of you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I want to add my thank you to the organizers uh, for tonight's event, to you all for coming, and Anne, thank you for sharing your story. Um, it's an honor to be with you. Uh, and I was looking at this great gathering and this panel, and I was reminded of a hard lesson that I learned when I was an early organizer. I was working for Move On, and I did a piece of national gun work with responsible gun owners, Chief, uh, and it was directed at the Obama White House. And we were trying to get President Obama to close what was called a gun show loophole. 
but it was too small a group of folks. We were successful. He did close a national gun show loophole. Our national laws are much poorer than our laws in Massachusetts. But that executive order didn't have a popular mandate behind it. So when the Trump White House came in, that executive order that was hard won by good organizing um, was flipped immediately. And so a gun show loophole at the national level is now back in play for us in the United States, which is why I was reminded of the absolute imperative of an educated and informed and active electorate and by, for organizations like Heads Up uh, and the DA's office and the Hatfield schools and you all here at Moms Demand Action who are carrying this for Massachusetts, making it impossible um, for us as a state to revert back um, as quickly as we did at the national level, unfortunately, because our laws have more substance than this executive order. Um, I was glad that Rep. Sabadosa um, reported on the bills. I was also tracking them. And one of the ones I'll just say a, a notch more about um, was the, the last one about gun data filed by Representative Marjorie Decker. So that was reported to both the House and the Senate. And that's a good thing. That means that both House members and Senate members can take action and you can take action in holding us accountable. And that is a particularly needed bill in the slate of priority bills because we don't know enough yet as a state, it hasn't risen enough to the popular understanding these stats that people have been talking about. So the folks here have been talking about them but the legislature isn't grappling, for example, with the suicide rate as related to gun deaths. And this will help us, it will force us to understand the gravity of the situation. The next thing I wanted to talk about was actually money. Um, so our budget cycle is coming up in the legislature and I know Moms Demand Action has had a number of priority pots of money that have been dwindling in the Commonwealth. One of them is a youth violence. Um, it's the Safe and Successful Youth Initiative, SSY. Now that has lost money year after year in the Commonwealth. Last year in the Senate, we were able to bump it up. I was able to help with that as chair of public health. Um, but that is a very smart and targeted line item that goes right to after school programs and helps young people actually get the training um, they need, right? To be able to, uh, you know, resolve conflict, to, to talk with each other, to talk about their feelings, to really deal um, on a number of levels. Um, the other thing that I'll just talk about, and so, the, you know, there are other line items like that that we could certainly talk, at, talk about and work on um, that would go directly at this, especially for young people. Um, and then I, I just wanted to draw your attention to one other bill that didn't make it out favorably this session, but I think is a very good bill. It was filed by Representative John Santiago, um, and it was a bill to look at gun violence, both the mass shooting, but then also individual gun violence and the trauma associated. And I just want to underscore what Anne was saying, the trauma associated with gun violence from a mental health and public health perspective. It's a very smart bill. It would ask doctors to ask one simple question. Do you have a gun in the house? And that would trigger then a series of follow-up questions. So treating it as a public health model, helping people say, engage in the conversation with their primary health care provider. Um, and, and get the kind of resources they may need, right? They may need them individually. They may need them to help secure their guns safely. Um, and so, it's a, you know, again, it's a very good bill. Again, it didn't make it out, but it could make it out next session. And it'll need that kind of popular mandate from folks like you uh, to get it pushed out favorably. And the last thing I'll say, closing, is that on Thursday in the Senate, we're going to vote on a mental health bill. My colleague, Julian Sear, uh, has been leading this. And one of the things that we're talking about with, re with regard to this mental health bill is the imperative around getting more um, mental health services, especially in our schools. Now, the Student Opportunity Act, which was an education bill that was passed in both the House and the Senate and signed by the governor, that has a little bit more money for school districts, but not enough. Um, and this bill will begin to expand that and it has a specifically targeted Western Massachusetts provision. Thanks to um, some good wrangling we did as a, as a team of senators representing this area. And it's, a, it's really a rural provision to help us really overcome what is a dearth of 
uh, health care providers, mental health care providers, uh, and often a geographical distance that really prevents our families from accessing the kind of care that they need and deserve. Um, so this bill will get voted on on Thursday. I'm, I'm, I'm really proud to vote for it and to work on, on expanding it and strengthening it with my great colleagues. Um, and, you know, again, it's a small step. It's just a Senate bill, so we have to go much further in partnership with the House. Uh, but I, I say that only to let you know that we're tuned in uh, to the fact that we need more care for our young people. We need more resources for our schools. Uh, and we need to treat gun violence systemically um, and with all the tools and resources that it deserves. thank our panel but uh, we're not done yet uh, what we want to do is uh, open it up for discussion and questions so uh, if folks have uh, a question of any of the the panel members just welcome you to come forward and shoot away no pun intended so. but uh, uh, but one of the things that's important is I think the discussion I mean you know gun uh, violence, uh, I think it's sometimes misunderstood. Uh, I know our office that sponsored gun buybacks uh, over the years, uh, people said you, criminals aren't going to show up and return their guns, <coughs> and that was never the intent. Uh, the intent was uh, really because we asked uh, hospitals and uh, mental health providers and um, law enforcement and different people in the community, our number one goal was suicide prevention. It was really, and also accidental death. Um, um, I had a cousin who died accidentally from gun violence. And, you know, young children, I mean, they explore and they find things. So as much as there's um, different uh, perspectives on guns and some feel it's over-regulated, some feel it's under-regulated, it's really the safety of the community that's uh, paramount. So I don't know, does anybody have a question? Do you want to do it from the air or you can come up to the microphone? <coughs> I have two questions. I was wondering, first of all, uh, firearms are just delays for people who have health care for people who have access to children. Uh, so I was wondering if you have any thoughts on that. And the second question is, um, what would the argument against having doctors asking one question? So, for the first part of the question, you know who I'm going to ask to come forward is Nick Fleischer, you know a lot about the services. Why don't you come up, Nick, and maybe you can talk about some of the, uh, the me me mental health. I think you're recording. Yeah, sure. But I'm not sure what the question was. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, the question is uh, about what, what mental health resources are out there for adolescents, about the providers and what kind of resources. So let me, uh, let me introduce myself. Um, uh, my name's Nick Fleischer. I work with Clinical and Support Options, and I work primarily with the Crisis Services Program there. Um, as a starting point, I, I think it's important that uh, people be aware of the availability of the Crisis Services Programs that are available throughout the entire state. Um, every, uh, every town has uh, a, an available Crisis Program. Hatfields is uh, CSO's crisis services um, uh, based in Florence, uh, but they, they will come out to people's homes. Uh, they will see people who are, uh, need to be evaluated in the emergency department. Um, and they'll make referrals to services, uh, clinical and support options, ServiceNet, uh, CHD, a number of agencies have outpatient clinics um, uh, that are all available with uh, youth and family services. Uh, one thing it's useful to know about is uh, that CSO in um, Northampton on Atwood Drive near where 91, the exit to 91, um, people can just walk in there and uh, be seen within, within an hour or so uh, if, uh, if they uh, want to um, uh, check out services. So I, I, there's a number of things available, um, but I really want to start off with the crisis program as, um, as something to be uh, alert to because it's, some, it's a resource that can be called 
um, 24 hours a day. If there's a problem at your house or at the home of somebody you know, uh, a friend, anybody you're concerned about, um, uh, you can either be seen or you can get information about where you can go. Um, I wanted to say something else about that. There's a table there, right, with all the resources. Great. Are there some CSO resources there? Excellent. Glad, glad to hear that. Uh, I, I did not come planning to present anything. Um, what else did I want to say? Um, I don't know. If you have any questions about, uh, about the, the resources, um, I'm here. Uh, you can come up to me later, or I can ask questions in this group. Anything else I should say about it? What about respite and hospitalization? What about respite and hospitalization? Well, what, um, what, what's available? A hospitalization is um, it's kind of a last resort. And uh, if you're seen either at the outpatient or at the crisis program at any of the clinics, uh, we're going to do whatever we can to keep kids um, at home. There, there are community resources or partial hospitalizations. There's a partial hospitalization program in, uh, in uh, Springfield, uh, there, there are um, uh, the one youth hospital program in Western Massachusetts is Providence Hospital in Holyoke. Um, and uh, if a kid needs to be hospitalized, we try to access the, that program because it's the closest one. And then the other close one is the Brattleboro Retreat um, in uh, Vermont. Um, respite is a challenge. It's a, it's a challenge for the state. Uh, you know, a, a place that a, that's not a hospital that a kid could stay in for a few days, that really doesn't, um, doesn't exist very easily. There, is, there are some specialized programs. I'm not going to bore you with it, but they're called, um, uh, they're called CBATs, uh, Child Behavioral Acute Treatment, something like that. But they can be accessed for uh, a youth to stay for a couple of weeks. But that's, that's really last resort kind of stuff. There are many, many alternatives before that. Um, there are uh, teams that will come out to people's homes. Uh, there are um, uh, uh, activity programs. There's, uh, Dial Self has just, uh, is just opening a, a program for homeless youth. Um, uh, and homeless youth are kids who may have just kind of been estranged from your family, say maybe from communities like your own. Um, and they've started a program right across the street from uh, the Vogue School uh, in Northampton. So that's, I think that's enough for now, but I hope that helps. Um, Thanks, if, Nick. Thank you so much, and thank you for being here. Um, if I could add to that as well, the, the bottom line answer that we usually hear is there just aren't enough. <laughs> Not enough beds, there aren't enough providers, and that's why I'm so glad you mentioned the bill that's coming up in the, in the Senate right now on Thursday contact your legislators, yeah. um, to increase funding, to bring more mental health professionals into the area. We just don't have the volume of mental health professionals that they have, say, in the eastern end of the state, and our suicide rates reflect that. Um, but that's one of the reasons why we can't underestimate one of the other themes that we have here tonight, and that's how do we as a community <coughs> work together to make our community safer? How many people here are trained in CPR? Right. You are exponentially more likely to come across someone having a mental health crisis than you will ever need to use your CPR training. Yet, even our licensed mental health professionals aren't licensed at any point of having to, required to have suicide prevention training. Yet, every single person in this room could very easily learn and educate themselves on how to help our friends and our loved ones. We as a community can start taking care of each other, learning the signs, learning how to help, and keeping, our, keeping them out of the hospital if that's not the appropriate place for them, or how do we keep people safe until they can get to see a mental health professional? Um, so that's an important <coughs> idea to keep in mind too, is how we as a community can come together to support the mental health of our children in our communities. You know, one of the leading, there's so many causes and, and Venn diagrams I could show you and all the and graphs about what causes someone to get to that point of suicide or violence. But at the end of the day, it's a lack of hope and a lack of connection. That's it.
a lack of hope, and a lack of connection. And if we as a community can't provide that to each other, then what are we doing here? You know, so yes, let's make sure we have all the mental health professionals we can have. Let's, let's pass these bills and get more funding, get more beds for our adolescents. But please don't underestimate the power of our community and each one of you to learn how to help people and to help bring back that sense of hope and community to our young people and everyone. El elderly, you know, the, the rates of suicide are, are triple in elderly men. You know, how think of that, that lack of hope and lack of connectivity that our elderly feel. Um, so, uh, yeah, please. I, I want to just add one other thing uh, on the uh, end of the idea of if you need help and you feel it's an emergency. The, the uh, historically, people think of the emergency department of the hospital as the first place to go. And the state is really committed to trying to um, respond to uh, both adults and youth in the community and to try to avoid emergency departments. There's so many reasons to avoid an emergency department. There's, first of all, it's long waits. Um, it's you're around other people that you really don't want to be around when you're in a crisis. And, um, and uh, you're much more likely to end up in a hospital inpatient setting when you may not need to be there. And uh, the uh, uh, crisis intervention programs across the state are much better equipped to uh, come to wherever the problem is, whether it's in the school. Uh, I'm sure your schools have worked with uh, our team many times. Um, and uh, whether we can also come to homes. And uh, there's much more of a chance of um, trying to de-escalate a situation uh, before it has to um, uh, get to a point of needing hospitalization. And then, additionally, there are resources uh, to send teams out for ongoing contact in the community, whether it's at home or at school. Just want to say, if we can avoid emergency departments, that's really a good goal. Now, if, if a youth um, has any kind of sign of a medical problem or uh, is uh, seriously and questionably <coughs> under the influence and we don't know what's going on, yes, we need to get them medically checked out. Um, and we'll still see them in the emergency department. Just want to add that piece. Thank you. I, um, the question is excellent. Um, it really is. And um, CSO, I'm a big fan. BHN, Behavioral Health Network, they're down in the Hamden County area, also do a fantastic job. Um, one of the things, though, you know, providing services, we have to, we have to, I think, do a better job at recognizing issues so that services can be provided. Um, which, which is a, a big step in the process. If we're not doing enough to recognize potential problems, um, then we can't get people to services. So one area, the, it's called NTAC, so it's a National Threat Assessment Center, um, doing risk assessments in schools. It's, it happens in, in other areas of the country. It's not something that I've really seen done around here, but it's it consists of multi-disciplinary uh, teams, which would be um, clinicians and, and uh, teachers, uh, police, school administrators, so on and so forth. And to give you an example of what I'm talking about, if somebody has a bad day at home, um, the people at home know about it. And then that person comes to school and has a bad day at school, the teacher knows about it. Um, so we have two things going on here. Um, and then maybe tomorrow they have a run-in with the police, another bad day. The police know about it, but the school doesn't know about it. The parents might not know about it. So you, these things start adding up over a couple of days. And if we were all communicating with one another, all of those things could have been brought forward and perhaps something could have been recognized. Now, we have in this area a pretty unique thing. It's called the Acts of 2004, Chapter 221. The, the DA would know what this is. Um, it's Hampshire and Middlesex, and is there one other county? Franklin. Yeah. 
uh, well, I th uh, there might be another one too, but yes, uh, Franklin, Hampshire, and, uh, and uh, Middlesex County, which essentially is an information sharing act that was uh, between all people, including probation, the courts, the schools, um, uh, you know, school counselors, psychologists, so on and so forth. So some of these mechanisms are already there. It's just a matter of us expanding on them and, and maybe putting them into play. Um, so, you know, there's some areas that we could probably do better or expand that would help uh, being able to, first of all, identify somebody that needs help so, so that we can get uh, these people help um, with these excellent resources. The other thing uh, with the bill regarding the, uh, the doctor asking, you know, is there a gun at home? It, it, it sounds so simple, um, right? It's something that we already use, actually. It's called a lethality assessment. We use that in domestic violence cases. And a lot of, and we ask a bunch of questions um, to try to determine someone's lethality. And it's, it's essentially a risk assessment. Um, I don't know if that has ever come up with the, uh, the bill language or anything of that nature, but these are simple questions. And again, when it comes to gun ownership and when it comes to responsible gun owners, none of these things, they don't hurt owning guns. They don't prevent anybody from owning guns or doing anything else. They're just common sense things that can make a big difference. Um, I just want to say, Chief, next time that bill comes up uh, for a hearing, and I hope it comes up next session, you have to come and testify. I only have um, one suit. Uh... <laughs> well, 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 maybe we'll bring you in remotely. Because the, to your question, the thing that really actually uh, made the bill find its demise this session was the belief that, in fact, that public health question, do you have a gun in the home? Um, or do one of your parents or guardians have a gun in the home, right, if it's a younger kid? Um, that was uh, coupled with a belief that there was a judgment, a negative judgment on gun owners. What you're saying, Chief, is actually what was the intent of the law, which was it's a responsible question to ask. And so responsible gun owners came and testified and said, this is a no-brainer. Let's ask this question. Um, we should be able to get these kind of services and um, what other, whatever resources might be available. Um, but then uh, another cohort of gun owners came and said, no, nope, this is a threat to our Second Amendment rights. And in fact, that wasn't the intent. This came from actually a conversation between gun owners and Mass General Hospital docs. And they were really trying to look at this systemically in Boston because as we know, there, there are mass shootings and then there's just daily shootings, daily violence with guns. And it's, it affects the people who are experiencing it and then it's all the residual community trauma. And they were trying to work that out on a systemic level. Um, and the other thing I'll just say to build on this question about resources, you know, I do think there's an opportunity for us to have a larger conversation about how we talk about health care in the Commonwealth, right? The, the mental health bill in the Senate is basically saying to us as a Commonwealth, hey, physical health care and mental health care are important. We need to have both, right? Mental health care can't be an afterthought um, or it can't be rife with regional inequities, right? Which is what we experience here in Western Massachusetts without enough resources. And then on a bigger meta level, and I, you know, I think this is, you know, a current tension. We have to have more preventative resources. Um, actually, I would say more preventative resources than we do crisis intervention resources. Meaning we ha we we know what's needed in the community uh, in terms of the things that prevent um, violence all around. You know, from good jobs to good services to transportation. You know, we know these things. We, we let them go too far down to this crisis point um, and where things are more critical, more dire, more deadly, more expensive. Um, so we just need to swim more upstream in the Commonwealth for these things that we know are good, make good policy sense, good ethical moral sense, and it turns out are good fiscal sense as well. Um, don't mean to hog the conversation. I just want to throw one other point out there regarding mental health. Um, I'll give you a hypothetical. Let's say you live in, let, pick any community, Fitchburg, and let's say you self-admitted under what we call a Section 12, which is a voluntary committal. And let's say you admitted yourself 10 times last month for, and, and there's only two ways you can admit yourself, homicidal or suicidal thoughts. That's what a Section 12 covers. So 
let's say you self-admitted 10 times for homicidal and suicidal thoughts last <coughs> month. Let's say you move to Hatfield next month and you apply for a gun permit and you're not statutorily um, prohibited from having one. I would have no, no record of that information whatsoever and I would issue the permit because that information isn't, it's not stored anywhere because they're, they're self-committals. So I would actually take it a step further. Now, obviously the question then becomes, aren't we, you know, you have HIPAA, HIPAA laws and so on and so forth, and we're stepping on somebody else's rights. But I, I just want you to think about that hypothetical for a second, that I would be issuing a gun permit to someone who was homicidal and suicidal because I didn't have that information. And then if something horrible happened, I mean, if it was one of your family members and I issued the gun permit, not knowing any of that information. So, not very nice. Okay, okay. Uh, I just wanted to make a little plug here. I'm, my name is Sean, <clears throat> sorry. I'm one of the uh, Heads Up volunteers. And uh, we actually have a website, hatfieldheadsup.org. Um, none of us are <coughs> clinicians. Um, but the website is actually stratified by age. So if anybody is looking for resources or information here in this community or in the surrounding community, I encourage you to go to the website. Also, we have a Facebook page. And uh, I just thought I'd also run the mic for anybody who would like to ask a question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I want to thank everybody for, um, for being here and for telling your stories. I think it's so important. I don't know which way to face. Um, so I have the, the privilege of working in schools, not only in Hatfield, but in lots of, um, in Western Massachusetts as an autism specialist. Um, and because I do that, I also work with children with challenging behavior um, in the schools. And so I feel like I have this um, insight, which is great, into the way schools work and um, one thing that I'm just kind of concerned about, and I keep kind of, my shoulders keep going up, is because mental illness doesn't mean violence, and developmental disability doesn't mean violence. Um, when Sandy Hook happened, I, I happened to be um, working for the, uh, running the autism division in um, Connecticut at the time. And so as horrible as that day was absolutely for everyone, what killed me was the quote, that's my autistic brother. And that quote did a lot of damage for a lot of people. And I think it's important that um, the heads up people put, you know, all this literature in our hands here, less than 5% of US crimes involve people with mental illness. And that's true for our developmental disabilities. And I think it's so important that stigma is part of this conversation because it doesn't mean you're going to be more violent. And you might be a little off and you might be a little weird and you might be a little quirky. And in fact, we know for a fact there are more and more people like that and children like that in our schools. And I just think it's so important that as we talk about resources, we talk about getting the resources not just to the schools and to the kids, but to the parents as well. Because 90% um, of what I do is helping parents deal with children with these challenging behaviors and they need as much help. So I think that in terms of the mental health parity and, and looking at all these laws, it's important that we talk about family support as well. And I just want everyone here to remember that um, developmental disability, mental illness, all these things are so important that we address are not the root cause, right? I, I mean, I believe that, are not the root cause of violence. And I think it's important to remember too that people with disabilities are much more likely to be victims of violence than anything else. Hi, I'm Melody Edwards. I'm um, a member of Heads Up as well. I just wanted to share um, a quick story, which is that my daughter, who's 18, um, we, we live in Hatfield, she was in a drive-by shooting, uh, or she's 21 now. She was in a drive-by shooting when she was 18. Um, she grew up here, you know. Um, she went to a party in Springfield, and she was walking with her friends away, and a car came and shot at them and her friend was shot. Um, she drove her to the hospital. We are dealing with the repercussions of that even still. She has not, she, she's just, there's so much trauma that comes from this. We didn't even understand at the time um, and we're only now just really understanding it. 
it can happen to, to anybody, anywhere. You know, it's not just because we live in Hatfield and it's a lovely place. It doesn't mean things don't happen to our kids in other places too and here. Um, and I just wanted to say that we, we also, our whole point with Heads Up is to destigmatize um, mental health and make, make people more aware of these things. Um, I think all of us have some sort of story where we've been touched by, you know, this kind of, you know, either suicide or, or these things. So I just wanted to tell that story to show that it, it's really close to home and it's, and it lasts a long time. So I'm a senior at Smith Academy. I've been in the Hatfield School System since seventh grade. Um, and my question is, how can we like, make a sense of urgency during active shooter drills, even though it's just a drill, without going to the extreme? Like, how do we build like, a sense of urgency for students to not just see it as like, a break during class? Like, oh, let's just chill out. Like, how do we make a sense of urgency to actually act and like that this could actually happen? That's why. Um, we would love to see a sense of urgency from not only the students, but the staff as well. Um, the problem with it is, is it's, I guess it's perspective. So, I remember being in high school. We didn't have active shooter drills. I mean, it wasn't that long ago, but <laughs> um, we had fire drills, right? Absolutely. Out of the school we poured and onto the, uh, the football field or, or wherever and um, never paid any attention to it. So I, I think part of that is, is just normal adolescent brains. Um, when it comes to a drill, we're getting out of class, we're getting out of work. Um, the, uh, although you don't really get out of class, you just get out of work um, at, at that time frame. But, so I, I think it would be up to the individual. I don't think there's a way to um, uh, force urgency on anyone because it is a drill. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's, that's a tough one. I'll remember you uh, at the next one. <laughs> I think it's, it's a see, great question. See, Mike's a lot younger. I had atomic bomb drills. You know, so. <laughs> I had those too. Um, it's part of what I was trying to say earlier, which is you know, that if you go to either extreme, it's problematic. If there's no sense of urgency and it's just routine, then if something actually happens, people don't respond necessarily. But if you go to the other extreme, it really can scare people and activate certain people. Um, that's why I was saying before that I think, you know, like when schools deal with all kinds of crises and emergencies, an active shooter is actually less likely in a school than many of the other things that schools deal with. So I think if schools can really focus on how students respond to the people in charge when they say something's going on, this is what needs to be done, that's probably one of the best things that, that can happen as far as rehearsing for these crises. Um, and not necessarily like instilling a sense of fear in students, but more a kind of sense of order. And it's like in the military or any other large organization where you kind of, you want to follow orders, you want to follow a drill, you want to go to a certain place. And I think that's probably the best that schools can do, not just with active shooters, but to put it in the context of lots of things that can come up. And when those things come up, students need to just salute and do what, ha what, what their teachers and principals and staff are telling them to do. I, I am by no means should be speaking on the active shooter drills except other than as a parent and hearing the comments that we've heard tonight. Um, I want to get back to something that Anna said that reminded me of how it, it seems to evolve 
as you're, you're younger, then you move to the middle school, and then you move to the high school. Um, my daughter is eight. She's in the third grade. And when she says, you know, we have drills in case there's an intruder. And I said, what's an intruder, honey? And she said, well, like if there's a squirrel in the building. Because <laughs> that's how they were explained it when they were in kindergarten. One time a squirrel got in the building. And if we all have to hide because there's a squirrel. And those first and second graders, man, they are intense about protecting themselves from a squirrel getting in the building. Um, and then as the kids get older, they know that the reality. We're not talking about squirrels, and yet it seems like there's less urgency and less intensity in those trainings. But the one thing I do want to throw out there is these are all relatively new. You know, in the grand scheme of our educational system, these lockdown drills, the, you know, we haven't had a full graduating class yet that's gone through these drills. So it'll be interesting to see over time the effect and the effectiveness and, and how these um, kind of evolve as our, our first class going through lockdown drills move through kindergarten, through middle school to high school, and then maybe in five years from now we'll be having a very different conversation. Something definitely to keep an eye on that evolution of this process. So thank you for <coughs> sharing all your thoughts with it. Yeah, just one thing, Heather, you made me think of is that um, at Smith College, one of the things we've been talking about is how many students come in with a sense of anxiety and kind of almost <coughs> fatalism about how this can happen to them, even if it hasn't happened to them. And that's something that, you know, even 10 years ago, students weren't coming into college with those kinds of fears. So I don't know, you know, I'm not saying it's the drills that have done it, but I think it's just knowing that this is a possibility and reading about it and, and the fact that it seems to happen on such a uh, wide scale, it's really shaken the sense of security of young adults who are now in college. Um, and it's something they think about and talk about actually quite frequently. Hi, my name is Doris Matson, and I'm with the Pioneer Valley Group of Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. And thank you, Senator, for recognizing us. Um, I, and I, I thank the representative and then <clears throat> and the senator for their hard work. Um, but I would like to um, stress to the police chief, chief here that there are loopholes, and that's where these laws come in. You mentioned a loophole. So um, at first you said, you know, our laws in Massachusetts are great, and that's true. We have strong gun laws. But you know, what we're doing now is working on those loopholes. So maybe there's a loophole. Maybe you can get all your, your police chief um, organization um, to testify on this. So, so I, appreciate, I appreciate your work. Thank you. Thank you. Just um, so when we're talking about these, I, I looked at the gun legislation that was currently being uh, considered, um, such as the crime gun reporting these are this has been on the books for some time it's we already it's already being used this is an enhancement to it um also when it comes to like the ghost guns um very good legislation um it's going to require them to be registered we have to register guns already so when i when i say new laws i don't it's not to attack any of these laws. These are just laws that we already have in place. These are enhancements to those laws. But you mentioned issuing, a, a, you, you mentioned issuing a, a gun license because you don't know about the person's um, self. Right. Um, what's it called? Self. So a self a self committal. So self committal. Yeah, and, and you know and that you're, to me seems like a loophole. It's not a loophole, um, <coughs> not even remotely, because we start getting into, this is a, a question I brought up. So we start getting into question of privacy laws and HIPAA laws, federal laws. Yeah. So we're not talking about loopholes. We're talking about actual laws that prevent this from happening. Does that, does that answer or clarify? Okay. Can I just follow up? I'm going to stay kneeling down. Um, I'd like to point out that we um, provided heads up, provided information for all of the, you that you can take home. Um, and on the back side of the statistics, 
you'll see a listing of resources. Um, at the bottom, you'll see Hampshire County Crisis. Thank you, CSO. Um, and on the back, numbers to call. But also, uh, Chief Dekoshek talked about recognizing uh, a potential emergency. And um, the National Alliance on Mental Illness publishes information about warning signs of a potential crisis and warning signs for suicide. So we encourage you to take these home, talk to your family members, talk to your friends. Um, and I just have a question for the legislators. Um, the challenges here in Western Mass, as you know, are uh, acute. Um, and those of us who work with families who struggle, families who don't have transportation, families, the lack of access, the lack of um, mental health supports, not just in our schools, but in our communities, even though we're right next door to Northampton where there may be more supports, but for some families, that's difficult coming from this town. Um, are there some provisions in place, and I read about the uh, vote coming up in the Senate about the possibility of tele uh, mental health. And I was wondering if you could comment a little bit about that and how that may hopefully help our, help our communities who are um, struggling. Thank you. Um, so you raised telehealth, telemedicine, um, or telemental health. Um, that is actually the, the Joint Committee on Mental Health and Substance Use came out to Western Mass because there's a program out of Gardner and here I want to really celebrate Rep. Whips, Susanna Whips, who hosted the committee. So I, I'm on that committee, Rep. Dan Carey's on the committee. Um, and we were up in uh, Athol for a hearing where people from Gardner um, came and testified because the transportation, just as you say, the, the lack of uh, providers, um, the transportation uh, difficulties, and of course the financial difficulties faced, especially in the North Quabbin area, had created a pretty, uh, acute situation up there in terms of uh, access to mental health services and other just other support services, frankly. Um, so they have this in place in Gardner. It is actually proving to be very, very successful. So this bill, there were a number of telemedicine bills in the legislature this session. I filed one, lots of people filed one um, because out in Western Massachusetts, we're trying to figure that out, right? So all kinds of different telehealth bills. Um, so we'll see a version of a telemental health um, provision in, in this. One thing that we're sobered about out in Western Massachusetts is that many of our communities still don't have broadband. Um, and so we are still, you know, we're still a year or more out in some of our communities to be able to see this um, democratically shared in Western Massachusetts, but there are hubs that can, like schools, um, that do have um, high-speed internet and they we can use these services in schools. So that's why we're thinking it's a good idea to try, even though we can't access it equally currently. Um, and you know, the, we still also need to track the data and the efficacy data around this. It looks good, and I'm grateful to people part, you know, who have pioneered it uh, and have tried it, especially up in the North Quabbin. And uh, you know, I think we'll take it a little bit uh, further down the road in the Senate bill. Again, it's not a legislative bill, right? It's the House needs to act on um, whatever pieces of it make sense to the House. Um, but you know, I, I think we need to also just be willing to continue to refine a good idea and make it as effective as it can be as, for mental health provision. Can I just add to that that um, uh, uh, CSOs are already using um, telehealth up in North Quab and in Athol. Um, the, the, um, the thing that allowed us to start doing this and that's been an advance is it's now paid for by insurance. That's what, that's what made the difference. Uh, we have the equipment. So, um, uh, so we're, we're just starting to experiment with it. Um, we don't always have a psychiatrist up there. We can have a psychiatrist in Springfield interview somebody in the Athol office and, um, uh, and it's like a regular session. We've learned, for example, and we have a big teleconferencing screen. And we've learned that's kind of intimidating to people to have, you know, a face that's twice as big as normal. So we now use the laptops, and it's much easier and more manageable. But so it's it's being experimented with, and I think with good progress. Yeah, and the bill is based the bill is based on current programs that were pilots initially. So it's it's leaning into, um, in this case, what's working right now in Gardner. 
And I just want to add to that because it's, it's always exciting and I always get a little jealous when we hear about the Senate bills, but they do have to come to the House as well. And right now we're, we're not hearing that it's going to come over to the House in a timely manner. And we are, you know, slowly, slowly running out of time because things need to be done by July 31st. So as you hear about these wonderful ideas in the Senate bill, please remember to keep up your advocacy, write to me, write to everyone that you'd like, but we do need to make sure that these get across the line in the House too, because if they only pass one chamber, they do not become law. Just a quick question. Nick brought up the point about insurance. And I just wanted to follow up on that. Is there anything happening legislatively because not everybody's insurance is equal? And some people do not have access to wonderful programs like CSO because of their insurance plan. Is, and I know this is a pipe dream on my part, but there, is there anything happening legislatively? Well, um, my, my signature bill is the Medicare for All bill, which would actually fix that very problem. And it is a thing that we're working on constantly. We know that it's not going to happen tomorrow. Um, but we are looking at steps and ways that we can move towards that so that the very issue you address can actually be resolved for people in the Commonwealth. Because we hear far too often that people are unable to access services, that they're unable to afford services. And, and quite honestly, worse than that, we're hearing that the people who do get services are sometimes doing things like skipping appointments, rationing medicine. And so that work is being done, and it's, uh, it's a, constant, a constant focus of mine. Um, and part of that is really, truly, when you, there are people like you who get up and say things, but also just traveling across the state and collecting those stories and building the support for it. Um, so that's why I look tired constantly. But <laughs> How can we help both of you? Around the, so around the advocacy issue, yes. How can you help? So I really believe in the power of these types of conversations and people getting together and digging into details. So the more times we can do things like this, I do sessions about Medicare for all and healthcare really everywhere. So we've, we've done one in Southampton, we're doing one in Northampton, we were up in Pittsfield, we were in Attleboro, we were in Stoughton, but every single time it matters. So if you are willing to organize something in your backyard where we can talk about healthcare and get details and talk to people about what the legislation needs to look like and figure out how they can support it, that is useful. And if you already think you know everything and you just want to write letters and make phone calls and send postcards, it all matters. And if you are friends with people in other areas across the state, help push their legislators too because we are going to need a mountain of support because... The insurance companies that you talk about where we have unequal insurance, they are going to push back. Pharmaceutical companies will push back. But we're getting hospitals. on. We got, just got a local hospital on board the other day, which is exciting. We're getting physicians. We're getting nurses. And we're going to keep that ball rolling. But it really does take a massive grassroots people power movement to make this happen. So everything and anything you do is useful. And, um, and any groups that you belong to, too. So we're looking to talk to dentists and to psychiatrists and to therapists and to figure out how do we make this bill the best bill possible so that it provides everybody with equal access to health care that is affordable and reliable and accessible. Because if it's not one of those three things, it's not health care. Um, I just wanted to say I love this question. Um, I totally agree with Representative Sabadosa about the need for Medicare for All. I'm happy to support that as well. Um, and I would just put one notch of specificity um, on letter writing, which is because you know that we both support it, uh, and it's certainly great to go on record because that's what we can say to our leadership, but in terms of the Senate, um, Senate President Karen Spilka um, would be your great person to write to, and also uh, Senate Ways and Means Chair Mike Rodericks. They're both really good people. Um, but hearing from a grassroots base of people, if you are believing that we need universally affordable and accessible health care and that we need it across mental health and physical health and all of these dichotomies that we're talking about, um, on the Senate side, let's make sure they hear it. I certainly can, you know, I certainly convey the widespread support from my district. Um, for uh, Medicare for All. It's a no-brainer for me. I I'm hoping it becomes increasingly a no-brainer. Uh, agree that the kind of grassroots, painstaking grassroots work is, is what's going to do it. It's the people power that's going to be this transformation. It's not going to come from the top. 
because it's just too big. So the people have to demand it. Um, and making going on record with leadership is very useful. Can I just ask a quick question too? Um, you all mentioned about insufficient resources for mental health illness and issues. And also you mentioned that uh, guns are the most successful form of suicide. You don't get that second chance. Uh, so we have red flag laws. Um, that hasn't come up at all um, today. And um, you don't really hear too much mention about red flag laws. I know we have them, but they're not advertised an awful lot. Um, and so I don't think a lot of people know about red flag laws. And then I think in the state of New York, uh, school officials can actually initiate a red flag action. I don't think that's true in Massachusetts. Um, so I think sometimes after you see these, um, the mass shootings, you hear students or uh, school officials say, you know, they, they thought something was wrong with so-and-so. They thought something like this could happen. Uh, so when it comes to the legislation, we have red flag laws. Uh, could we actually expand that to maybe allow school personnel to, to participate in that? Um, we, we don't call it a red flag law, even though that's exactly what it is. We call it an ERPO, which is an extreme risk protection order. And right now, uh, it, family or household members or the police can file for uh, what they call an ERPO, um, which can temporarily uh, take away somebody's gun license or guns, depending on the circumstances. So obviously, if a family member has, you know, has concerns uh, that one of their family members um, is potentially suicidal um, or at risk in general and they have access to firearms, they can petition the court as, as well as us. Now, I will tell you anybody that comes to, you know, the Hatfield Police Department at least, um, that, it, that expresses something of that concern, it's something we're on right away. Um, the other part of your of your, it, it, I think that's two kind of different things. Um, I think statistically, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but when it comes to schools in general um, of knowing beforehand, I think the figure is something like 81% uh, when it came to school attackers. 81% uh, um, uh, the plan was known beforehand to some extent by other students um, or something of that nature. It's a huge that's a huge number. Now, you've heard the federal government has been pushing for years. Um, if you see something, say something, right, when it comes to terrorism or something of that nature. Um, so I think education, when it, when it comes to that, if you see something, say something. If you believe something, say something. If you feel something, say something. When it comes to the schools, um, because, again, with a number that high of you know, that's astonishing. It really is that it's that it's that number is that high. So yeah. I was just gonna say I think that's a great example of where um, efforts could be made to maybe work with kids in schools about the the dilemmas that come up when you know about this and you don't wanna um, you know, rat on somebody as it were, and yet what happens if you don't do it? And in some ways, those would probably prevent a lot more deaths than, um, than some of the drills that we're having. So, yeah. I just wanted to add to, to your point where you said you don't think a lot of people know about them. I was looking at the statistics because this is a fairly new law, that the AIRPO or the red flag. And I know that there were a lot of people locally who were really working hard to push for this. So I was looking at the statistics after this first year, and it's less than a dozen people who have had their their firearms removed because of this law. So, you know, I, I thought there had been a lot of pushback originally by people who said, oh, you, you know, this is a way to take people's guns away from them. And there was, there was a lot of opposition. And it did pass overwhelmingly because it was also in part in, in response to these school shootings. But I do now wonder if maybe some of that is because of a lack of knowledge about the law or if that's just the situation that we're in, which I do think speaks to the need for, for increased data collection because we know what the first year looks like, but we don't actually know why yet. I, I also want to jump in on this. Um, having worked on some of the passage of the, uh, the ERPO bill, which we were pretty, pretty pleased to get through, um, because it also opened up a lot of conversations. Like I was in Don Hummison's office having a conversation about, about this with him. He and I are 
in other places, separate places politically, uh, but we had a really good common ground kind of conversation about this. Um, and part of, part of what um, I think is new in a lot of ways about ERPO, we did do a mom's demand and every town did do a very significant ad campaign in Springfield and Holyoke. Um, I don't know that we were doing lots of billboards out here, um, but part of it too is that it is, it is kind of a new law um, and it's not only family members, but it's also household members. And this includes anybody who was engaged to the person in question, had been living in the same household, is or was related by blood or marriage, has or is having a child with the respondent, um, had been in a serious dating relationship. And we're talking about this kind of in the realm of, of adults. Um, in terms of school situations, I think this goes back to the access that I was talking about. Because if we have, you know, 41% of folks have reported having easy access, when we're talking about guns in schools with children, they're getting the guns somewhere. They're not buying them because they're not at the age of majority to legally buy a gun, but they have access somewhere. And that's the other part that we need to really kind of think about and talk about because we have resources available for an adult who is in crisis. But if there's a child in crisis, um, that becomes a lot murkier in a lot of ways because then it becomes not just the, the child in crisis, but where did that gun come from? I mean, I live in Holyoke. We recently had a situation where we had a child who I think was six or seven brought a loaded gun to school, just had it in their backpack, picked it up at a grandparent's house and just brought it in. And, and, that, is, and, and that is a failure on so many levels. Um, the, the grandparent in question is now facing charges because this is unsafe storage cooperated poli with police, but everybody was horrified, and rightly so, because that is the other piece of this that we really need to focus on and work on. Um, not just the mental health aspects, not just the crisis aspects, but the access. Oh, what we found, you know, with the, the children have brought uh, weapons to school, um, and you talk about school climate. It's really, Hatfield's a noble uh, example of how open and how kids talk. I mean, it, it all comes from the leadership of the school system. I mean, we had the superintendent here earlier. We have educators. Uh, it's having that open communication so kids feel welcome uh, to talk about what's going on, uh, to, to say to a, a trusted adult. Uh, and I really do <coughs> because as I look at the different schools around our district, I'm really pleased with the fact that that, that communication is really emphasized and that whether they talk to a teacher, a janitor, a trusted adult, or a fellow student, it's really important. So I think that communication, um, you just can't take that for granted. It's just something that you want to ingrain and it comes out of a, a school where kids feel good about themselves and, you know, and talk to those trusted adults on a regular basis. Eva, I've got a question. You sat there all quiet. You ready? So my name is Nancy, and my daughter is in the same grade as Ava. And I know that we had the shooting or the suicide in Northampton recently, and I talked to my daughter a lot about it. And she um, was very open, and it was very interesting and insightful. So my question for you is, do you feel that you could easily go and find a resource for you if you were in crisis, or if you felt fear for your friend, could you go and talk to somebody? Do you know where you would go? Yeah, they talk about that a lot in school, like all of our guidance counselors. They talk about it a lot, and I would be comfortable going to any of my teachers, and I'd be comfortable going to any of their parents or my parents if I felt like one of my friends needed help or if I needed help, and I think they're all really open about it, and that helps a lot. Do you feel that they're really open about talking about it so it's easier to yeah, like, talk about it? Yeah, I think we it? could go, like, we have a lot of certain teachers who talk about it more and, like, our guidance counselors, um, and they give, like, we've talked about, like, who to go to in certain ways to help, like, cope <laughs> with it. That's awesome. I'm very glad. 
just a thought because I know we do have a lot of parents in the room. Um, one activity that we do a lot with young people and adults as well is um, we ask them to take a piece of paper and it's private just for them, but list the name of three people. <coughs> Write down the name of three people that you could go to if you were concerned about a friend or if you um, were, were concerned about yourself. And we give them a moment, we let them do that in private, and then we say, and by the way, if you don't have three names, put my name on there, you know, just as a little reminder. Um, so that's a great activity to, to kind of take home, do with your own children, do you know, in a classroom, take back. Um, it's, a re it's a way to remind them that even if they can't think of three people, there's always one person there for them. So I could, uh, as that response was being given by Ava, I could see my school resource officer over there jumping up and down. <laughs> now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to adopt for us since coming on to the um, position I've also gotten my lab certified as a therapy dog so she comes in she's a member of the police department she works as a comfort dog primarily in the schools with me um, but is also available in town as needed for community events like this. We go to the senior center for coffee with a cop um, and are available at local fundraisers um, or wherever it finds itself fitting. Um, but I've been in the schools eight hours a week uh, since the start of the school year and it's gone really well. I've had a lot of students um, who have made connections. I've heard a lot of third hand uh, positive reviews in the community, parents of parents saying, hey, you know, my son or daughter's interacted with you, you've made a big difference in their life. Um, I think that's important to portray back to the school committee to keep the position going. Um, we enjoy being there and it's just another outlet and a way to connect uh, policing to the community, which is huge these days. Um, we're here for you as well. Um, and most of us have crisis training in addition to our normal policing duties. Uh, thank you for the sales pitch. <laughs> The, um, the crisis training she's talking about, it's called CIT, um, it's crisis intervention training. Um, a lot of police departments all over the Commonwealth are sending officers to this. I, we currently have, I believe, five that are trained, including myself and, and uh, Officer Ruddock back there and Officer LaValle. Um, uh, it's a, it's a excellent program, but it, it discusses everything from, uh, you know, mental health and, and autism and so many different factors uh, that go into uh, what could potentially be going on with somebody and, and how we handle that as police officers. Um, resource wise, if you need a resource, we have resources. Uh, there is no question about it, whether it be for, for um, our, our children or for or even yourselves. Um, we have many of them. In fact, I probably have 20 alone in my phone right now of, of resources <coughs> that could be offered. So they are out there. Thank you, Chief. Well, we've, uh, oh, uh, we're out of time, but do you have a quick question? One last question, and then we're going to wrap it all up. This is in reference to this uh, comfort dog. My name is John Pease, lived in this town for 65 plus years been on the fire department since 1972, retired after 36 years. But I know what a comfort dog can do for the emergency service personnel. We went to an accident, and as anybody knows, um, wasn't a good situation. We had Northampton fire that came in to help us to see grown men, women participate in a group debriefing of our feelings to have a dog right there. I can still see this now, uh, white Akita that this social worker brought in. And that dog just worked the whole crowd, put its head on its, you know, your knee. Some people would be just rubbing it. And as we were talking about our feelings, and this was an accident that could have been prevented, of course, but to see young people suicides or these mass shootings. Look at the trauma that our 9-11 um, people uh, went in, dug out survivors or not, and worked. Our soldiers that are coming back, suicide veterans.
my wife's uh, minister, her son, took his own life. And she devoted all her time and effort now to service dogs to work with the veterans. You know, guns, you know, who, who shoots them, you know, everything. Uh, it's a big, it's a big issue. But to have something like this in our school, I remember getting trained after Columbine here to make sure that, you know, what we were doing was right. You know, that was how many years ago? 25 years? And to think about Hatfield, look at Sandy Hook, you know, rural communities, uh, the Amish community several years back. You know, all this stuff is, you know, but these kind of animals, you know, and the officers that work with them think they're worth their weight in gold. Is it all political? Yeah. You got you to put money where your mouth is and uh, for training, you know, everything like that. I worked at Smith College, took the president of the college, drove her to Cooley Dixon Hospital. How far is that, Mr. Miller? Not too far. Wait here for me. I'll be out in a little while. She was there over three hours with a student. She says, I'm her parent here at this college. The parents dropped them off. I'm responsible. Who's responsible here? You know, our, student, our superintendent, all the way down to the teacher, to the custodian, to the bus drivers. Chief Mike, you see a kid get on the bus in the morning, bad attitude, it's gonna go through the school. Am I correct? You know, and that's where you see him. So it's all, all related. It comes down to parents or grandparents that are watching kids now, whomever. You know, it's a, it's a different world now than when we grew up. And I see classmates here. We're practicing for new drills. Am I correct, Liz? Put our heads between our legs? Yeah. Yeah. So it's not a, you know, this is serious. This is really serious. But something like that we could have had, you know, back in the first grade, six, you know, six-year-old, you know, playing with a dog. I think that's important. I think that's important. Thank you. And for you, for you ladies, for our chief, make sure that these animals stay in the schools. You know, thank you. Thank you. Well, I want to thank everybody again for coming. I want to thank Heads Up. It's a great organization that really inspires our community uh, to be a model community for, you know, working with youth and with adults. So uh, uh, keep working hard. And again, thanks to the Hatfield School System and our superintendent and other educators that are here tonight. And uh, especially to our panel. Great group of people. And uh, really thank them.